It is a joy to worship with you this morning and find in your Bibles the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11 this morning. This morning I conclude a series I began just a few weeks ago. This is our third and final message in a series I entitled Compassion Without Compromise. We've been talking about some of the most volatile and controversial issues in our culture. We've been talking about homosexuality, we've been talking about gender issues, we've been talking about same-sex marriage, and we've been talking about what the Bible has to say regarding these issues. Um, by far, this has been the most difficult sermon series I've ever preached. Uh, normally, when I begin a sermon series, I am always uh, looking forward to it. I'm anticipating it with great joy. I love to preach, and so when I'm preparing a series, I love to study, I love to prepare. This has been probably the most difficult series I've ever preached, uh, at least that I can remember. And let me be clear about this. It's not because I'm ashamed or embarrassed about what the Bible says, because I'm not. I want to be clear. It's not because I'm ashamed or embarrassed about what the Bible says. We will always hold to the truth of the Word of God. We'll always stand with the Bible. But I think it's because this issue is more than just biblical theory. It affects and touches so many people. This issue is more than just words and phrases in the Bible. It is flesh and blood. It is real. And there are people in our community, people in our church members of our families that are struggling heavily uh, with this issue because of loved ones or even personally struggling and families are being torn apart and there are more questions each and every day about how to deal with this issue or how to face those dealing with this issue and so I, I didn't realize when I began this series that October was Pride Month. Pride Month is uh, the month where uh, those that are LGBTQ+, plus, questioning all of that, that uh, they, take, they take their time to represent their pride and their lifestyle. And, of course, within Pride Month is Pride Week. And within Pride Month is October 11th this year, which was National Coming Out Day. I'm not smart enough to coordinate all that, all right? It's not, it's not coincidence. It's God's providence putting all of this together. But I, I did not realize when I was preparing this series that we would be talking about this in church and there would be so much talk in our culture about it as well. In fact, just last week I, I read a couple of articles. One article was about a lady who identified as a man who now wanted to identify as a dog. And she was questioning, uh, you know, how, how does that work? A lady who identifies as a man, now they identify as a dog. And then I read an article as well about a female cycling group and the ladies were very upset and angry because there was a male who identified as female who won the entire cycling circuit. And they said, that's not fair. It ought not to be like that. And so it's almost to me as I read that like God designed male and female differently to function and perform in different ways. And so ultimately, uh, we're going to talk about the Word of God today. We're going to talk about what everyone else around our church is talking about. We're going to talk about what our culture and our community talk about, and we're going to talk about it from a biblical perspective. And we begin with five principles to remember. I've given you lots of points and long introductions in these messages. I promise this one hopefully will be a little bit shorter, but I want to give you five principles to remember as I conclude this series today, Compassion Without Compromise. I'm preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, this subject, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. That's a text taken directly from this passage of Scripture. Let me give you five principles to remember before we dive into the text. First of all, the Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. I want you to remember the Bible is our sole authority for what we believe and how we live. The Bible provides us the pattern, the guide, the rules by which we ought to live. The Bible gives us the way that we ought to live our lives, and it gives us the things that we ought to believe. The Christian church has held to the authority of Scripture 
for 2,000 years. And for 2,000 years of unbroken church history, the Bible has taught us what it means to be married, what it means to be male, and what it means to be female. And the Bible speaks very clearly about that. In creation, the Bible says God created male and female. He created them. I never imagined that it would be controversial. And I never imagined that we would be, by many, to be said on the wrong side of history on the issue of male and female genders, that God created two genders, and that God created marriage between a man and a woman for a lifetime. I never thought that would be controversial, but it is indeed very controversial in our society today. It is seen as narrow-minded, it is seen as insulting, and it is seen as hurtful. In the end, listen carefully, in the end, we either believe the Bible or we don't. In the end, we either say the Bible is our authority or it's not. We either submit to the teachings of Scripture or we say that our feelings and desires and culture can superimpose its opinions and ideas on the Word of God. At Second Baptist Church, we believe that the Bible is our sole authority for life and for practice, and as long as I'm the pastor here, that's the way it's going to be. We believe the Bible. It is our sole authority for faith and practice. Secondly, we love everyone that God loves, and God loves everyone. We love everyone that God loves, and God loves everyone. Here's where I believe the church has failed on many counts. We have screamed, we have yelled, we have hollered about the truth, the truth, the truth, yet we've held up the truth without showing love. And so those to whom we scream, we argue, we fight, we fuss, we type back and forth on social media about all these issues, those with whom we disagree, we've been disagreeing with them in a very hateful or hurtful way. And that is honestly the truth about the church in many respects and at many times. But I want you to understand, while we've been faithful to the truth, we've often been lacking in our love, and I think the Bible commands and calls us to do both. The church ought to hold to the truth in love. Can I, can I tell you something this morning? I want, I want our church to be known in our community for a lot of things. I want us to be known as a church that stands on the Bible. I want us to be known as a church that believes in Jesus. I want, to be, I want us to be known as a church that worships the Lord. I want us to be known as a light in the darkness. But I also want us to be known as a church and a place that loves every single person. Listen carefully. Jesus loves you no matter what your sin is. Jesus died for you no matter how messed up your life is. Jesus can save you no matter what you've done. And we love everybody that God loves. And God loves everyone. That's what we're called to do. Number three, we cannot and will not compromise biblical truth to accommodate cultural change. Can I be honest with you? This series is not, it's not difficult because I'm embarrassed or disagree with what the Bible says. That is not the case. It's not that it's hard to preach or teach these messages because we just, we just don't like what it says, but we've just got to agree with it. No, I believe what the Bible says, and I know that God has the best plan for marriage and the best plan for gender identity and the best plan for our culture, no matter what circumstance or situation we encounter. But we cannot and will not compromise the Bible and the truth of the Word of God in order to accommodate cultural change. Mark my words, as years go by, you've already seen it, and we will continue to see churches, denominations, religious organizations, and famous pastors and teachers who will change their mind about this issue because the cultural pressure becomes too great. The cultural pressure to go along in order to get along when it comes to homosexuality, same-sex marriage, gender issues is incredibly intense. But we cannot compromise the truth of the Bible just to fit our changing cultural norms. We must, we must preach, teach, and believe the Word of God. Number four, 
We will hold to the truth of Scripture while loving those with whom we disagree. Can I just tell you this morning, we ought to be the most loving people in the entire world. We ought to be the most loving place in the entire world. Jesus told us to love our neighbors, and when he gave an illustration to a Jewish crowd about loving their neighbors, guess what he used? He used the least likely group of people that they would want to associate with. He talked to the Jews about the Good Samaritan, and he said, that's who acted like a neighbor. Jesus tells us to love our neighbors and then places no qualifications on who your neighbor is. You know who your neighbor is? Anyone you encounter. And he doesn't say, love the ones you agree with, fight with the ones you disagree with. What does he say? He tells us we ought to love one another. We'll stand on the word of God and the truth in a loving and winsome way. You can do both. It's possible. Number five. The gospel is for everyone. And anyone who comes to Jesus can be saved. We need to hear this today. The gospel is for everyone, and anyone who comes to Jesus can be saved. Often when we deal with issues so controversial, I'll have somebody ask me, do you believe homosexuals can be saved? That's a tough question. But my answer is absolutely yes. The gospel is for every single person that is alive and breathing, for every person that has ever existed, and for every person that will ever exist. The gospel is for everyone, and any person, no matter what sin that we have committed, no matter what sin we are entangled in, any person who comes to the cross in humility and repentance, trusting and placing their faith in Jesus, can be saved, forgiven, set free, and adopted into the family of God. The gospel is for every single person, no matter what their sin is. Now, people say, well, what if they don't repent? And I would say this. What if someone refuses to repent of their pride? What if someone refuses to repent of their addiction to pornography? What if someone refuses to repent of their anger issues? What if someone will not, in humility, come to the cross in faith and repentance? What does the Bible tell us? You see, can they be saved if they don't repent? Can anyone be saved if they're not willing to repent? The Bible is clear that repentance and faith, that humility and confession is part of what it means to come to a real, genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, no one can be saved unless they repent, but anyone can be saved if they will repent. So with that in mind, let's dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and deal with our text this morning, verses 9, 10, and 11. Would you begin reading with me the Word of God? Paul writes to this mixed up, messed up church in the town of Corinth. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, that's a large category, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It's a hard word. Verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Remember this morning, God's Word is perfect. It has the power to change and transform our lives. As we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11, I see two major points that I want to bring out in this message. The first is that sin affects everyone. Sin affects everyone. Sin affects every single person. Anyone that's ever existed has been affected by sin. There's only one Only one individual who was born and lived a perfect sinless life, and that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Sin affects every single person. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. That's why this letter is called 1 Corinthians. It's the first letter he wrote to the Corinthian people. There's another letter, 2 Corinthians. And so Paul is writing to this church. This church had a reputation of having some serious problems. Did you know that? If you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you're going to find all kinds of mess. This church had serious problems. 
Makes me wonder, have you ever, uh, you ever been driving down the road and you saw this little church on the side of the road and it was Corinth Baptist Church? Have you ever seen that? I've seen Ephesus Baptist Church. I've seen Sardis Baptist Church. I've seen all kinds of, but I've seen a Corinth Baptist Church. Like when you read about the stuff that was going on in the town of Corinth, you're like, why would anybody name their church after this church? It is a mess. This church is so messed up. I mean, he talks about so many issues. There was a great deal of sexual promiscuity. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and having fights. There was a a son-in-law who decided that he wanted to marry his dad's wife, and so they were having an affair. I mean, it's crazy messed up stuff in the church at Corinth. And so here, Paul is writing to try to set some things right. They came out of a culture... I mean, the culture of that day was very sexually promiscuous. And and here, Paul is writing to them, let them know that God has given us the standard for every area of life, including our sexuality. The Bible is the owner's manual, and it must be obeyed. Look at what he says again in verse 9 and 10. Let's look back at the Word of God. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul specifically deals with all types of sin here. Do you notice that? Paul's not just singling out sexual sin. He talks about adultery. He talks about uh, sexual immorality. He talks about homosexuality. But he's dealing with all kinds of sins. He's dealing with sins that are sensual in nature, that are sexual in nature, that are spiritual in nature. He's dealing with all kinds of sins. And then he says, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Doesn't seem like Paul's afraid to tell you what he thinks, to tell you what he believes. Now, that's a bold statement. But it's easy for us to take homosexuality and to say, well, it's listed here. And so we need to make sure that we tell the whole world what the Bible says. What's harder for us is when we read some of the other names on the list, the sexually immoral. So so there's there's a broad category here. I've told you the Bible doesn't just doesn't just talk about homosexuality. The Bible, when God gives us his standard for sexuality, God's standard for marriage His standard then excludes premarital sex. It excludes adultery and infidelity. It excludes use of pornography. It excludes bigamy or polygamy as well as homosexuality, bisexuality, and those sorts of things. You see, God's standard here is it's big, right? God's standard eliminate so many other things. But I want you to notice this list. He talks about the sexually immoral. He talks about idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals. And then he says this, thieves, uh, here's one, nor the greedy. Oh. It's easy for us to talk about a sin we don't struggle with if that's not our struggle. But what, what about being greedy? You never had a problem with that, have you? Anybody who's ever seen commercials on TV or got the Sears catalog way back in the day, Or has an Amazon account. Today, we struggle with greed, don't we? We've all been there. Now, here's another one. Nor idolaters. We don't have a problem with that. We we think idolatry is like bowing down to a gold statue. Or the people of Israel when Moses is coming down the mountain and there's this golden calf. It just, just popped out of the fire. I don't know where it came from. We just bowed down and worshiped. We think that is idolatry, but I'm going to paint a real clear picture for you and for me as to how we struggle with idolatry today. Are you ready? This is real simple. Look at what I'm holding in my hand. This is a smartphone. Smartphones make us dumb. You know that, right? And so uh, here's, here's something I know. The vast majority in this room have a smartphone or a cell phone. Those of you that don't, you have intentionally not bought one for a reason. Congratulations. You still got your flip phone and it takes you like, if you want to type one word in a text, you have to press 39 buttons. (laughs) This smartphone, has there ever been a moment in my life where I ought to be present with my family and instead I'm staring at this screen? Is there ever a moment in my life when my wife is telling me what to do and I'm staring at the screen? Yeah, you know. 
Is there ever a moment in my life where I ought to be reading the Word of God and I'm caught up scrolling Twitter or Instagram or looking at the news? Or Is there ever a moment in my life that I make this, this, more important than what's really important? Hey, that's the definition of idolatry. Did you know that? When you take anything and make it more important than what is most important. When I take anything and make it more important than God, guess what I've done? I've made that an idol. Boy, that, that hits home to a big college football fan. That hits home to a Georgia Bulldogs fan, especially when they lose. I'll walk in church in the lobby and i like, Preacher, are you still smiling today? There was a moment, there was a time in my life that would ruin my weekend. And you know what God convicted me of? That's idolatry. Because is Jesus still Lord? Is he in control? Are you still saved? You know, I know, I know, I know what I've done. I've gone from preaching into meddling now, right? I'm messing with your business. Messing with your business. I understand. But the reality is every single person here, every single person has struggled with idolatry. Paul's point is this. Paul's not writing a book about homosexuality. Paul's not even writing a book about sexual immorality, although in 1 Corinthians, it's rampant in the church. Paul's point is simple. It is that sin affects everyone, and different sins affect different people in different ways. Homosexuality is one of those examples of sin that certain people struggle with. But there are many other sins, even sexual sins, that so many struggle with. Lust and pornography, premarital sex, adultery, polygamy, all of these other things. There's so many more sins. It's not just homosexuality. If you're here today and you are still awake, do me a favor. Raise your hand. All right, just raise your hand. All right, we got a few, a few Baptists in here that are like, uh-uh, I'm not going to be accused of being a Pentecostal. I'm not lifting my hand. All right. <laughs> Everybody in this place, hopefully you did what your pastor asked you to do. You raised your hand. Everybody, do it again real quick. Raise your hand. Everybody with their hand raised, guess what? Sinners. Didn't you come to be encouraged today? I know you did. <laughs> everybody, everybody in this place, my hand's up. I should put two up. Everybody, we are all guilty of sin. Sin affects everyone. Sin affects you. It affects me. Wonder why you've got mess in your marriage? Sin. Wonder why you can't get along with your kids? Sin. Wonder why you struggle so much at work? Sin. Wonder why traffic's bad? Sin. So many sinning drivers out there everywhere. Sin. Sin affects everyone. That's the point. Now I want you to hear this. Jesus changes everything. Ah, oh, this is good. So here I've painted a picture of how our sin separates us from God. It affects all of us. It puts us in a position where we can't get to God on our own. We can't reach Him. We're separated from Him as a result of sin. But now, notice this, Jesus changes everything. Yes, homosexuality is a culturally charged issue. And I've got in my notes today so many examples of churches and denominations that have begun to cave on this issue. They are rampant. They are everywhere. Liberal churches have, have redefined compassion to mean the church changes its message to meet the modern demands. They argue that to tell a homosexual that he's a sinner is uncompassion and intolerant, but that's like arguing that a doctor can't tell a patient that they've got a problem or an issue. Listen, spiritually speaking, if we're going to be able to help those who are in need, we must be able to tell them the truth in love. We must be. That's our goal and that's our desire, grace and truth. But most every major denomination in Christianity in the United States and other places, they're having a conversation. I could go through this, but I'm going to, for time's sake, I'm just going to, the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church USA, Church of Scotland, and many, many more who've already changed their stance on this issue, a stance that they held for, for centuries. It's likely, can I tell you this, it's likely to get worse before it ever gets better. 
What I mean by that is the pressure on the evangelical Christians who stand on the Word of God is going to increase. Because when it comes to homosexuality, the evangelical church is about the only thing standing in the way. Do you hear me? Al Mohler says this, The homosexual rights movement understands the evangelical church is one of the last resistance movements committed to biblical authority. Because of this, the movement has adopted a strategy of isolating Christian opposition and forcing change by political action and cultural pressure. And the question is, can we count on evangelicals to remain biblical on this issue? The pressure is only going to get greater. It's only going to be harder to stand on the truth. We ultimately will be ostracized. We ultimately will be minimized or pushed into the corners or the shadows or the closets. This illustrates what we're up against when we're facing this issue because it has turned into not a biblical issue but a civil rights issue in our society. And we gotta, we got to be careful. I, I, don't think, I think in my lifetime as your pastor, churches will lose their tax-exempt status over this issue and many others. I believe we will. I don't know, I can't imagine being in prison because, you know, preaching the Bible equals hate speech. But I'm telling you what, uh, America is not far away from that if we take a few left turns or wrong turns here and there. This illustrates what we're up against when we talk about this issue, but I want you to notice what Paul says in verse 11. I conclude this sermon, I conclude our series looking at this. Verse 11, and such... Or some of you. Circle that, underline it, highlight it. And such were some of you. But, that's the largest contrast you can make in the Greek language. That word, alos, means in opposition to everything I just said. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see what he's saying? Here are the people that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he gives this long list. All of us are guilty. Not just homosexuals. Every one of us is guilty of sin before God. And then he says, but such were some of you. This tells me that Jesus changes everything. He can change your heart. He can change your life. He can change your desires. And he changes your destiny. He changes you from the inside out. He goes through and says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. I love this. The Corinthian church was full of sinners. It was full of sinners, just like every church is. You know what a church is? It's full of sinners who've been forgiven by Jesus and who desperately need to be forgiven every single day. That's what the church is. And here he says, they're ex-thieves, they're ex-murderers, they're ex-those that are idolaters, they're ex-fornicators, they're ex-adulterers, ex-thieves, so many. He's saying every Christian was sinful before they got saved. I had a sin problem before I got saved. Jesus saved me, and guess what? Now I'm fighting from victory instead of fighting for victory, but I still battle sin each and every day. And so do you. And Christ came for the purpose of saving sinners. This is the great truth. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, you might just want to walk through this last verse with me, but you were washed. You were washed. You know what that means? That, that means that we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we've been saved, we've been rescued. This speaks of new life, regeneration. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, listen to what he says. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus saved you, he cleansed you and made you new. He forgave your sin. He wiped the slate clean. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. He said you were washed. You were sanctified. Washed speaks of new life. Sanctified, this speaks of new behavior. This this means to be made holy inside and out. Wow. You know, the Christian life is a process of sanctification. That sounds painful, but what it means is Walking daily and growing to become more like 
Jesus. In Christ, we're given a new nature, and we're given the power to live out that nature. He said, you are justified. That speaks of new standing before God. God is the righteous judge of the universe. And as sinners, we're separated from God, but we're also guilty before the judge. But through Jesus Christ, the Bible says we've been justified. That means we now have right standing before holy God. Before the righteous judge, we have right standing, not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ that was given to us, it was imputed to us at salvation. Justified means God looks at me now through Jesus, and it is just as if I'd never sinned. That's how much God forgives you. Justified. He says you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Because of Jesus, his willing submission to the Father, his virgin birth, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, he now offers salvation to every single person. And that's it. That's the conclusion of the sermon. It's the conclusion of this entire series. And that's what I want to leave you with. Here's what I want to leave you with. Sin affects everyone, but Jesus changes everything. That there is always hope, always forgiveness in Christ. I have no truth except the truth given by God. I have no hope except the hope given by God. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. There's hope for anyone who's willing to come to Jesus. He's got enough grace to cover our sin. That's the kind of God that we serve.